So welcome, welcome to this, the first uh, In The Game Of Golf uh, intro webinar. Um, I'm Bevis Moynan um, and that's Michael Gilmore who's on, the other person you'll be able to see on the screen. So welcome to this first uh, webinar and really I wanted to just spend some time to take you through a little bit of background to why we're all here. Um, I'm a golfer myself, you'll be pleased to hear that um, the person hosting this is a golfer themselves who experiences all of the the greatness that is the game of golf and has experienced some challenges over the years uh, with the game as many of you will, will have done and really what I wanted to do is kind of explain really why um, I'm so passionate about doing this, why, why I'm so passionate about really sharing this information and knowledge with you because ultimately all of us who play golf want to fully enjoy the experience, to fully connect with the game and in truth, as a golfer, I want to get better. I want to really enjoy that experience. Um, and what I've found over the last seven or eight years as a coach and a trainer, who's a trainer of new linguistic programming and training hypnosis and timeline therapy and other technique-based evidences. And, and what I've learned really is that there's lots of things that you can do that improve your game, but ultimately, Ultimately, there are some fundamental principles that have a much more profound effect at a deeper level. Um, and ultimately, I think what, we'll, what we experience as golfers is that you have times where it's wonderfully enjoyable. And there are also other times when I know that my clients have experienced frustration, disappointment, anxiety, and all of those things that, that can come with that. So really today, I kind of wanted to share with you my own experience of, of golf. I, I remember vividly after doing one of my coaching courses, I kind of ran straight to the driving range, 13 handicap at the time, and I started to th kind of think differently about the game, became aware that in a pre-shot routine I was counting to six, and what was, what was all that about? So I had an enhanced awareness all of a sudden of what I was doing, and no surprise, I had a, a reputation as a, as a slow player at the time. Uh, and realised there was lots of things that I was doing that weren't actually helping me um, in terms of my golf game. So that was the start of a journey. Um, I then also remember attending a, uh, an inner game workshop at Hemingford Golf and Conference Centre with, with a, a guy called Jamie Edwards presenting, wonderful charismatic presenter. And he was explaining kind of his approach to the inner game of golf and some of it resonated with me. And at the time, I'd just finished my coaching qualifications. That's how I thought, hmm, I could do this. There's 80 people in the room here wanting help. And, and actually, there's knowledge that I have that can help these people. And the first coaching client was actually uh, a young man called Chris. Now, Chris is um, actually now my marketing manager. And he, in, in truth, is kind of the inspiration behind this webinar because he... Um, kind of nudged me in the right direction and said, come on, Bevis, you've, you've, you're doing less work in golf than you used to, and, and what you've done with me, with my golf, really helped. So you had to get back out there and do some, some more work. You don't, you can't, haven't got any capacity for coaching clients, but why don't you actually put something out online to help people? And if Chris back then, he had a bit of the, the yips with his chipping. He was playing off four or five um, at the time, and Jamie Donaldson, his coach, kind of had that issue where technically there was nothing wrong with Chris's chipping, yet when he went out on the course, he had issues actually executing the skill. And of course, through helping him, that was the start of my journey as an inner game coach. And, and a journey that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed, enjoying that experience. Um, but also what happened over the time that I started training more and doing more and more work in golf, having more and more experience of the inner game of golf. Um, what kind of happened over that time was that um, I began to realize that what I was teaching in terms of state control, in terms of methodology of techniques that people ought to use, and also some of the work I was doing one-to-one, -one, I began to realize it was an incongruency. And what I mean by that is that as a golfer myself, my own handicap came down from 13 to, to 5. Yet I wasn't using what I was teaching. And that didn't sit very comfortably with me. It was, well, what's going on here? Well, I'm getting better. And my clients are getting better, but actually I'm not applying the things that I'm teaching. And that got me thinking, really. And 
kind of started me moving in a little bit of a different direction. Um, and ultimately, I think I was very performance focused, very focused on achievement. And at a very simple level, a very simple level, and a, and a, but also a, a deeper level. When you think about, and I'd like all of you to now think about the purpose of why you play golf. Um, and in fact, actually, if you want to post anything on a question, on the, on the question, just have a think about, if you ever think about what the purpose of playing golf is, why do you play? And when you think about that, and you kind of keep asking yourself the question, you ask yourself that question, why do I play golf? Ultimately, if you keep asking yourself that, well, I play golf because I want to get better. And if you think about young golfers, age 17, 18, from the work I've done with young golfers, focused on maybe making a career out of them, often they think the purpose of it is to achieve something, maybe financially, maybe to get to a certain level of status within the game. And then you ask, well, what's the purpose of achieving that? And what's the purpose of achieving that? And ultimately, you get to a position where the purpose of playing golf, purely and simply, is to enjoy it. And then you think, what percentage of the people playing golf right now on the courses around the world are actually enjoying it? And as a club golfer, you look around the look around your course, you can see that and the smile whenever I do this live, people chuckle and smoke because you can see that actually there are a number of things affecting the enjoyment of golf at any one moment in time. I was actually coaching earlier today with um, a, a guy who runs a business, he also plays county golf, plays off a plus one. Um, and he was saying that his golf has become much better since his expectations changed. Um, and of course, we're beginning to move into an area of, of things that we'll be sharing with you throughout this uh, this webinar. I don't just start to steal too much of Michael's thunder with this. And when we come on to the second half of the webinar, he will be sharing with you some deeper principles and philosophies that help you to gain greater enjoyment or, put a different way, get out of the way of yourself to allow you to fully experience the game of golf and with that, the freedom to perform at your best. So if you think about the purpose of playing golf is purely to enjoy it, therefore if you're not enjoying your golf in any given moment in time, you're not being successful in that moment. So really a lot of this is about learning to begin to get out of the way of ourselves through a greater understanding. Um, and as somebody who's been trained in NLP and time and therapy and hypnosis, the, the, this, isn't, this webinar isn't going to be about that. It's going to be about explaining something at a deeper level which you can apply not just to the game of golf, but also hopefully at a wider level. Um, so it has implications beyond just the game of golf because um, as many of you will have experienced, the game of golf can quite often mirror life. Um, it has the same challenges um, and therefore knowledge can help you both in your golf game but also at a deeper level. So I'd like you to also think, and this is kind of a, a key question for you, I'd like you to think about what is it during a round of golf that gets in your enjoyment and performance. Um, if you think, have a think about that. What is it that gets in the, in the way of your enjoyment and performance? And typically, when you ask an audience of people this question, what is it that, that gets in the way of enjoyment and performance on the golf course? Answers will come back around things that happen i.e. actually having done this, it's often playing partners, which is a bit crazy, right? That we're allowing somebody else that we're playing with to to annoy us, or so it seems. Or it can be us not playing or missing a certain shot. And yet we watch the television, and of course the top players in the world are missing shots all the time. But as an amateur golfer, we have the expectation that we're not going to do that somehow. So there's often this expectation of performance that isn't met, Often it can be other players, it can be that I've found people get annoyed and frustrated by the weather, um, by slow play. Um, often it comes down to our own expectations of our performance and then other factors. But most of the time it's about factors outside of us that 
people who come to these workshops and webinars and they attend and they find that those things seem to be negatively affecting their enjoyment, either through frustration, frustration of how they're playing, frustration of slow play, frustration about the weather, disappointment about them not playing as well as they would like to play, anxiety, all of a sudden getting really anxious. I was at a, a dinner recently where the question that was asked to the speaker was, how do you deal with first tee nerves? Because he found he had a big tournament coming up and the anxiety had raised and raised and raised and raised. And, and he was kind of, that was a genuine question of what is it I can do to, to handle that? So these are the kind of types of things that we find that our clients as in a game coaches have issues with. Um, and what happens with that is that what we find at a deeper level is often there is a misunderstanding of what pressure, anxiety, frustration and disappointment actually are. Now I've left stress off that list because I believe that stress is a, an overused term in that stress really is just the application of a pressure over a period of time, which is kind of more the dictionary definition. Um, but when you think about all of those things we've just discussed, pressure, anxiety, frustration, disappointment, all of those things seem to be in response to some external circumstance outside of us. And at this point, what I'd like to do is hand over to, to Michael and and kind of you have a think in the background whilst I'm handing over control of the webinar to Michael. What I'd like you to do is just have a think of what you believe pressure, anxiety, frustration and disappointment are and what they mean to you in terms of your golf. When is it applicable to you? When do you find yourself having those difficulties, those experiences? And are those things the things that get in the way of enjoyment of golf? And what, what I'm going to do is hand over to Michael now um, and what I'd like what I like to do is just have a think about that whilst I hand over, he will take control of the webinar and explain to you his take on what pressure, anxiety, frustration and disappointment really are. And through that deeper knowledge, um, you'll find that your own experience of playing the game of golf may, may change. Uh, and then we shall lead to what's coming next. So Michael, over to you. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Well, thanks very much, Travis. Um, yeah, firstly, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be joining you here on this webinar and talking about arguably the area that many amateurs um, and non professionals kind of look to improve. They know it has an effect on their game, but sometimes do very little about it um, that mental game or inner game. And so, I found myself who was playing, it was kind of easy to go down the driving range and hit some balls and get that swing coach and, and get the, you know, well drilled or grooved in the swing. And yet, even at my level, it was 18, it was, uh, it was the best I got down to, how I was playing regular. And even at that level, it was erratic, my performance. And so, I didn't have so much confidence, I have to say, about just how I was going to play showing up um, on any given day. And that was interesting because you like to think that with all the practice and the experience you had over many years, um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, growing up by a local pitch and putt in this course. I got to play a lot as a kid, a young teenager, a barely a teenager. And um, yeah, like you outlined there, it's certainly resonating with me, the fun aspect of the game. In those days I played with nothing but the fun and the banter. It was only when I started to start looking at my score and having some thinking around getting better that I started to look um, outside of me for those improvements um, and then the story would work me around from there. So what I've come to realise um, about the game and how and this applies to sport in general, you know, it isn't unique to golf. There's a mental aspect to mini games, and golf is among a small group of sports where you've got a lot of thinking time. Mm. So, i.e., it's not a like a football where there's plenty of running around to do, you're very active, you're thinking about your moves and what you're doing, and the dialogue even with your, your co players on the pitch. All very solitary game, and so. 
in between shots and waiting for other people to play, <laughs> particularly on that more important portal, you uh, yeah you can spend a, a lot of time to do. And so, what we like to think through all our traditional practice methods is that we'll get get onto the course and our muscle memory and all the drilling that we've done will take over and, and we can just get it. Just call out the yardage and pull the trigger. And of course that would be the optimal way to play and at some level we I think we understand that. That, in my experience and from talking to others, is rarely the case. <laughs> and, uh, and so what happens is you get to, to the course, you realise what part of the game is, is not strong pretty early on. And so you start to develop a bit of thinking about it. Um, whether that's the short game, putting, uh, and could be the dreaded long arm, you know, there's, there's lots of different elements. It doesn't really matter. And ironically for me, it was, it was quite random sometimes too. And, uh, and so you never really knew what it was that was going to show up. And, and that made it very elusive to pinpoint just what was going on, what, what should I work on. And then you might develop mindsets of the, the favourite club, for example, um, or conversely the bogey club. You, know, you really don't, don't want to use it, you don't really believe that dreaded yardage that it might fall to the fire bar or, or whatever it is. So, like you, looking at, at techniques and uh, particularly pre shot routines, I got pretty big into that thinking that that would somehow kind of reset my mental state and, and my, my muscle memory kind of back to some sort of default setting. And I could then go through a routine and, and that would get some consistency and, and drive in some uh, natural play. I think that's what we probably all yearn for, the natural swing when you, you hit the ball. So what happens is we tend to be developing and practicing while we're on the golf course. And this is what inhibited its score, generally. And I think you'll know this to be true because if you recall a time when you've had a really great game, you've played really well, and enjoyed it too, by all accounts, I think they, they go to hand in hand, that you probably wouldn't recognise, you wouldn't have actually had a lot of thinking about the game. You'd have very little recollection of quite what went on. I mean, you can remember the shots. And, a memorable parts or, or well placed uh, execution on, on ball position, things like that. But what I mean is, you won't be much more in flow in the game. So you're literally using the old kind of uh, cliche, but you're playing it one shot at a time. And many people get caught, and myself no different, that you can be playing your, your current shot in the past. And so I, you're still ruining the score on the hole before, or the last half a dozen holes, whatever, and, and the game's gone down, and so you're thinking about that part of the game, so you're not fully present when you come to the shot. And another error is playing in the future. <laughs> so you're already thinking about what I need to do, and that comes to some of the words you were uh, alluding to earlier, the pressure, of uh, what well, I, I really you know, and a really time and birdie here to, to make up for that bogey somehow. And the truth is you can never make up for that bogey. That will always be a bogey on the card. <laughs> and so, in truth, the best thing to do is just forget about it. <laughs> and you can say, oh, that's great advice, and I listen to this women after, so that kind of, so you're saying stay in the moment and forget about it. Uh, yeah. But as you'll know, as that kind of statement comes into your, your brain, you already you might have the question saying, so how do I do that? Because it sounds easy. Um, my wife tells me two things lots of times and I, I'm quite forgetful. <laughs> but somehow, once I get onto the course and uh, I might have played a, the hole before, for example, and I might remember a bad shot. Now, where does that come from? Um, so these kind of gremlins can get into the system a little bit. So, Talking about kind of the meat of the conversation, really, so what can we do about it? Well, it's the understanding, really, about how golf always works. Growing that domain, that's the area of greatest improvement. And what I mean by that was it was the philosopher Gregory Bateson who said that man's greatest advantage 
and advances in life will be made by his understanding about how life already works. So that isn't to say a brand new discovery or technique or application for something. It's understanding how it already works. And that's what we're talking about, our principle. But we know if we have something in our hands and we let go of it, it's only going to go one way. We reliably fall to the floor every time. And so that's the principle of gravity. And whether you believe that that's at play or not, you might dispute it, consider it a theory, none of that really matters. But the fact is that that's a principle that's going to outlast our time on the planet. And it's been here if the time began. So we would be better off understanding some of those things. So your advancement is going to be by a better understanding about, about the principles at play. So there's a, a reality almost around how to move golf ball from A to B. Yeah. There's gravity, there's wind conditions, there's humidity, there's the grass, the light, all these things, but it's a constant now. And if you look at your understanding and how life already works, how the reality already works, the gap between that understanding and how it already works, the bigger that is, the less chance you've got of performing in the rest. So it's closing that gap that's going to give you things from golfers. Michael, can I ask you a specific question from, from a golfer myself who is currently playing? Um, and what you said about playing either in the past or the future resonates um, with me and I'm sure a number of people who are listening in either to this live or in a future recorded. Obviously we're recording this so I know people will either be live or, or listen to this later today. Um, so my best round of golf was actually um, when I came back from a month in Thailand and I hadn't picked up the clubs for, for five weeks, um, which was quite ironic really because I'd been playing and practicing quite hard before I went. And I played a round of golf with a client and I wasn't really... Do you know, I didn't actually really want to play because I had a lot of work to do to catch up after a month out of the office. So I went out and playing golf without really thinking I was going to enjoy it, without really having any expectations. And all of a sudden, I got to the 16th hole and I was one under par. I'd never been one under par through 16 holes in my life. And would you believe, at that precise moment, guess what happened? I started to then think, crikey, I'm one under par. And at that moment, having swung the club beautifully all the way around, and interestingly also, my distance range finder wasn't broken, so I was, I was, 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 had no batteries in it. So I, I was just playing purely on instinct, just taking one shot at a time, and thinking back, not really analysing anything in any great detail, just playing on instinct. Now, I'm not recommending that's what everybody does, but at that moment in time, that's what was working. Started to think on the 16th tee, and literally, I nearly missed the ball. I hit half the ball, and it went half the way on a par three. And I ended up one over, having made two bogeys on the last three holes. So that's a, a classic example of, of what you're talking about, um, where all of a sudden, I started playing the game of the golf, not in the now, but in the future. So... I know that people are listening to this. There's going to be an element of people wanting a quick fix of, okay, what do I do? So I'm in that situation and I start feeling myself get het up. What would your advice, I mean, is there a, is there a quick fix or is actually, is the implication that this is a, a, a lesson learnt over a longer period of time? What would you say to that person who's after a quick fix? Well, the person who's looking for a quick fix, I would suggest that from what you discussed there, you highlighted that their recognition that it's the principle of thought that's at play. And so this means that their thinking in the moment is dictating their behaviour and their performance. And so when you have very little thinking going on, and as you said earlier, through those 16 holes, it's just about club selection, pull the trigger and, and hit it, versus whatever else comes up for you in terms of doing better. You're giving yourself much more to do and you're interfering with the system. So that thought that occurs, we can treat it as though it's real. And the truth is, it's just a thought. And so when you're in the past or the future, those places are memories carried through time. You can't go back there, they, they don't exist. And you can't possibly travel forward to the future. So. We can only ever be in the now, 
and it's understanding about being present and dropping that thought is what will allow you to be free really of it is, is to, to know you don't need to hold on to it good. Good. and in terms of taking this forward over the longer term one of the things that kind of resonated with me when we first had conversations was a very simple philosophy around thoughts and emotions because I think a lot of golfers think that pressure, anxiety, frustration, and disappointment are kind of these real tangible things that someone or something does something and we feel that way. And sure, actually, we all have triggers that, that make us feel a certain way from time to time. But equally, I think you've shared in the past that you go and see a comedian and one person's laughing and the next person sat next to them is not laughing. Or a football game, you've got the Arsenal fan and the Tottenham fan watching the same game of football, having two very different experiences. So we we begin to realise that it's not the event making us feel the way that we feel, it's our thinking about those things. And at a very fundamental level, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there's that understanding of which comes first in terms of a thought and a feeling. So what would your, what are your, a bit of a pun really, but what are your thoughts on, on that in terms of, thoughts and feelings and an understanding kind of the, of the role thought plays in terms of our emotions, both on the golf course and, and outside of that. Yeah, well, emotions are, are a category of feeling that, that we like to describe. Um, sadness or joy, kind of emotions that go with that. It can bring a physical response. Um, and feelings are uh, their thought. It's just one thing, one and the same thing. So. It's a perfect system that we have inbuilt, that's innate within us, that our feelings are there to really just tell us about our thought in the moment. So they're not intelligent in themselves, but people, you know, me too, I mean, for years before I understood this, I thought that my feelings were some, had some intelligence. They knew what to do, you know, if I felt nervous about a shot or anything, I know I should be. It take more into the consideration of, of the hazards or whatever else is going on. And in truth, was that nervous thought, uh, feeling that I had was simply reflecting the fact that I just had a nervous thinking and a pattern developing in the moment, nothing more. And this is really somehow so important to convey to people that when you've got a feeling, it they aren't intelligent, it doesn't know anything about the circumstances at all. All it knows about is your thought. It's a complete expert, an unqualified expert in one thing, and that's what you're thinking in your mind. And so, some people describe that as sometimes two sides of the same coin, um, can't have one without the other, and, and it's the same thing. So, when we look at it this way, we start to recognize that it's just a calibration almost of the thinking that we've got and we don't need to act on it. This is a wonderful liberating thing. When you've got that feeling, I found it a tremendous release to suddenly realise that it wasn't what was out there that was causing it. That, that was actually happening inside of me. That was my thought process taking place uh, and it wasn't real. And I think that kind of covers nicely as a sort of a blanket statement over words that we use to describe the pressure, anxiety, frustration and disappointment. Um, what I'm saying here is that all of those words there is pressured thinking that you have or anxious thinking. It's not actually an external stimulus or something outside of you that's causing that. And you've already outlined really eloquently there how people in exactly the same circumstances can have a completely different experience. And I certainly have this on the beach. My wife can be completely at bliss with how it is lying down with a book, and I'm just sweating, you know, uncomfortable, doing something else, having a dip. So it can't be coming from from outside like that. It's coming through us as an experience, and therefore how we think about it. And it's full recognition is the first step in getting a better in a game. If you could just notice that one thing, that would make huge advances. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I think there's a great quote by Jack Nicholas where there's a couple of stories about Jack Nicholas where he realised 
at a very young age that he could still play good golf with negative thinking, uh, which I just love as a quote. Uh, and another one was where he was walking up the, the last fairway with um, Tony Jacklin in the British Open, and they were kind of level going into the last hole, and they both hit the, the shots down the middle of the fairway. And he turns to Tony Jacklin, and Tony Jacklin's a young British kid, new on the block, um, and he turns to Tony and says, Tony, probably not in my accent, I have to say, and he says, Tony, how are you feeling? And Tony kind of goes, uh, well, in a nervous way, actually, not too good. And then and Jack turns back to him and said, yeah, me neither. Um, and actually, Tony Jacklin talks about that being a pivotal moment in his development because he went on to win a major the following year because he realised that the greatest player on the planet was feeling just as nervous as he was at that moment in time and that that actually, the difference was Jack wasn't paying any attention to how he was feeling. He was just accepting that that's how he was feeling. It didn't pace any, it wouldn't concern him. Um, and in essence, at the, the higher echelons of sport, um, to a degree, sometimes people embrace that, that that's happening, they accept it, and they accept it will happen. Um, so it's an interesting thing when you realise that at a higher level, people don't fight their thoughts, they just accept them, and they accept that if they're not feeling good, it's just a sign that their thinking isn't as clear. And, if they're, and that this one philosophy really kind of changed my life significantly because when you realise that you're not, when you're feeling, when you're not feeling good, that your thoughts are less clear, then you're less likely to act on those, on those thoughts. Um, you're less likely to act from a place of anger, frustration, disappointment. And when you do that on the golf course, you're a little bit stiller, and you can take a step towards what you've talked about, playing one, literally playing one shot at a time. Um, and I know there'll be people listening to this who find themselves playing golf better in match play than in stroke play. And why is that? Because the, the, in those environments, they, they, they literally do play one shot at a time. So I think just that very simple philosophy of that your thoughts create your feelings. And if you are feeling not the way you want to feel, it's because your thinking isn't as clear. Um, but it doesn't mean anything. That, in the, in the, that, that, that moment will pass. Um, so is there anything that you'd, in terms of pressure, anxiety and frustration, pressure, I guess, is, is applying in the moment some meaning to something, perhaps making something mean more than it means. Anxiety, I guess, could be is similar. And frustration is often an expectation. We start making something, we start re thinking that actually we've, almost beating ourselves up for not achieving a certain expectation and the same with, with disappointment. All of those things are just, what you're saying, Mark, is it's just thought. And to just, rather than holding on to it, to just let those thoughts go and focus on what's going on around and the next shot. Is there anything that you'd like to kind of, kind of add to that? Because I think it's, in essence, when you hear this, it's, it's quite simple. Um, Sometimes people think, oh, there's got to be more to it than that. But actually, I think the simplicity of it, the, it is, is also the beauty of it. Is there anything you'd like to add from, from what we've discussed so far? Yeah, I think for many people, that's a, a response I get more often than not, actually. It can't be that simple because we're conditioned really to think that we've got to look outside of us for enhancements, for performance improvements. And... If you look at an embodied understanding, which is what we're talking about here, versus an application, so it's an implication-based learning rather than an application-based learning. So an application-based learning would be when you get taught a specific technique and you go on the course and, and deliver on that. An implication-based learning, that's something that's embodied, like riding a bike. It's the implications of gravity whilst you're riding that bike. And it's an understanding. So it's not an intellectual learning, and there's a great place for intellectual learning, that's for sure. But using that example, if you were 30 years old and you'd never ridden a bike, and you were locked in, a, in an office for six months, and they said, right, you've got access to all these cycling magazines and books, the internet, teach yourself how to ride a bike, and then in six months we're going to present you one at the top of the hill, take it on with it. There's no one that could ride that bike. 
It's got to be an embodied understanding of what's going on. It's not an intellectual learning. So this understanding of thought, and that taking form in the moment, that's an embodied understanding about how life works. So Tiger Woods in his prime, for example, I mean, he was arguably his understanding about how to move a golf ball from A to B was better than anyone on the planet by some way. And at that time, he was the most studied guy on Earth. I mean, in terms of video footage, cameras, all angles, everything. If you were trying to model anyone, he was the guy. So he was, un he was under such kind of almost microscopic focus that if you could replicate what he was doing outwardly, you'd be pretty close. And the fact was, no one was at nowhere near close because they didn't have the embodied understanding about how a golf ball moved. And so bringing that back to pressure, anxiety, frustration, and disappointment, what's, what's interesting about that group of words for me is that, I mean, in the English language, they're, they're referred to as normalizations. And we're not really taught that at school. I certainly wasn't. <laughs> so, yeah. So this is a this is a group of words that have no inherent meaning or value intrinsically to themselves, unlike nouns, adjectives, or, or any other words. So, what happens is we use these words as a noun phrase, and then create them into a thing. So. Like a chair is a, a real noun because it belongs to an actual object, a real thing. If I had ten big chairs, I could give them to you and they'd be yours because they're things. But if I had a lot of pressure, you can't give half of that to your caddy and say, I'm feeling a lot of pressure. Can you just take half of it and I'll play a lot better? Because it doesn't really exist in anywhere except thought. Now, I'm not saying that stress and pressure just doesn't exist full stop. What I'm, I'm saying is that the thought exists, and then you get the physiological response. And because the thought exists, it's there for a very good reason. Um, the fight or flight response is what nature intended that to be for. So that we can make a decision in a, you know, less than a moment of a moment, you know, minute, split second decision whether to run or fight that woolly mammoth or whatever it was that was threatening us back then. And as we've become more dominant on the planet, that response is, is not really needed um, on our day-to-day -day basis. And it was only meant for a very short time to make that split decision. And we end up carrying that pressure of, or oh, am I going to get eaten? Is something going to jump out of the bushes of me? Whilst we're on the golf course. And this is very damaging because the cortisol and the Adrenaline that that releases, etc., was designed to give us that that power when we need it. That's kind of happening for us when we cool. So, when you want to be relaxed, you can imagine that your thought system is actually creating someone who's very tense, and you're already up against it before you hit the ball. Yeah. So, in essence, Michael, um, and something that I've heard people describe before you talk about is talking about rather than actually labeling it differently rather than it being labeled as pressure anxiety frustration labeling it as pressurized thinking or anxious thinking or frustrated thinking uh, and, and having that awareness that in any moment you are just feeling your thinking and those thoughts aren't real and that they will pass so actually rather than fighting your thinking and trying to change it to just accept it and allow that moment to pass with the knowledge that the best golfer of all time said that he could still play good golf when his thinking wasn't as clear. So it's kind of what we what we're talking about is is placing less emphasis on trying to change and fight your thinking and more emphasis on being aware that if you're not feeling the way you want to feel, that actually your thinking's just gone off track for the moment. Uh, and actually, you've said something to me about the natural mechanism of the mind that actually it will return back to its natural state. Um, so anything you'd like to comment on that in terms of um, allowing kind of those moments to pass? Because some people will say, oh, well, that's very difficult. It, I kind of get caught up in the moment for a number of holes. I play one bad shot and then 
all of a sudden two or three holes have passed. What would your what would your take on that be in terms of um, helping them? I guess begin to embody this knowledge. Yeah. So developing some thinking around um, a series of shots or anything that happens, you start to get in that kind of full spiral. When you recognise that that's that's happening, you know, when you've got an understanding that it's it's all then you can quickly let go of it and recognise it as such without actually doing anything. And I think it's you can be blase about it once you've been around the understanding a little while because it could be a revelation for many people listening to this that like what well, my thoughts aren't real, you know, because a lot of people they if they believe they're great at golf or they believe they're a good putter, they want to maintain those thoughts or beliefs of of that, and yet they're they're no more true than I'm. No, I'm no good with the driver. Yeah, it's, they're both. Terrible. And so, as soon as you see that as such, that's liberating in itself, and has implications in a way outside of all. Yeah, yeah the, there's the realization that from a neuroscience point of view, we don't experience reality. That there's lots of information and data out there, and we only see a snapshot of that. Was interesting in terms of life changing realizing that actually the mind works more as a projector than it does as a as a receiver that, that we project outwards from our thoughts and when we realize that we have 60,000 thoughts a day um, and that you can't possibly be consciously aware of all of those that actually you have moments when you're thinking clearly and you're feeling good and moments when you're not thinking clearly and not feeling good and that applies to golf as it applies to life and Therefore, to, to not act and just allow, to, to be still and allow those moments to pass when you're not feeling good um, and, and is kind of the key to, to making the good decision when you've hit the ball in the trees rather than to try and think your way through it and make, make up for the mistake, to just think clearly in the moment. Let, allow those emotions to pass through that old thinking and get some clarity in the moment of what's the right shot for this particular shot. Um, and of course, the applications are in golf and beyond that. Um, so those those two realizations that actually your well, thoughts aren't real, um, you can't possibly control all of them. So just accept them and let them pass. Um, and that really we don't experience reality. And if we did, all football fans would have the same experience of games, and all golfers would have the same experiences to um, different circumstances. Of course, that's not true. So. Oh really really fascinating Michael and really great to share this this experience this webinar with you anything else that you'd like to share uh, with our listeners um, to this webinar before we kind of move on to the, the kind of the next elements and kind of also discuss where where these series of webinars are going to go next yeah I think I'd probably just like to underscore the, the, the last bit that we talked about there really in terms of appraisal like that the self-correcting mechanism that is in the, in the mind, you know, what, on it knowing what's what is innate health, what's a nice, you know, a nice feeling, because that's what's normal for us. You've only got to look at babies and very young children, you know, they're in a, a nice feeling a lot of the time. Because they've got a lot of thinking about it. So when we get revved up, as you talked about there, of when we have spent a bit of time in the long grass or in the woods, whatever it is, that it's been the disaster. Um, Knowing that without us actually doing anything, the mind, very much like the body, if you've got a cut and that, that's got to be healed, you don't actually have to work on your, how good am I at healing this cut, you know, and put my attention on it and get it scab over first, I really need that to happen. You know, it's self-correcting, it's going to repair itself. And that's why everyone will experience having a worst day of your life and wake up in the morning and everything looks different. So, Overnight, it's that processing, that self-correcting, getting you back to innate health and clarity. It's really already there for us and in our favour. Good. So, in essence, it will be a surprise to some people that we're really kind of recommending that they do nothing other than allow their thinking to pass in the moment and to just focus on what's in front of them and be in the now. Because I know that the simplicity of that message will, will surprise them. Um, especially from the likes of myself and you who've been trained in 
variety of different methodologies and techniques uh, from kind of a neuroscience background. But that was the discrepancy for me. As a golfer who went from 13 to 5, I found I wasn't applying what I was teaching. And that didn't sit comfortably with me. And what I realised is that my my journey as a golfer had, had developed from actually applying certain principles and not really worrying too much or thinking too much about any outcome. Uh, and and obviously there were moments where I did that. Uh, so thank you, Michael. I really appreciate sharing this webinar with me. It's been great. And I'm sure there'll be opportunity to kind of um, add further content in a moment. Um, so just kind of really want to emphasize before we finish that often people are looking in the wrong place for the solution because the understanding of the problem isn't right. When you understand what the problem is and we understand the problem is purely a misunderstanding of the nature of thought, then we can look in the right place for the solution rather than trying to find the next quick fix. The next quick fix isn't like my mate who's got five putters in his boot. There's a bit of a, a signal that you're looking in the wrong place. And this isn't replacing technical lessons. If you want to improve your golf, your understanding of how to move the golf ball from A to B, you need to have golf lessons like I do. But that is also only part of performance. There are top level of golf. There are hundreds of people in the driving range who are the one shot separates winners and losers. And we know that actually what makes a difference is what's going on up there. And rather than trying to control it, nature is meant to flow and energy is meant to flow. And by actually understanding the problem and understanding the nature of thought at a deeper level, you can allow your thinking to pass when you have some poor thinking on the golf course. Um, and you will, you will find that you end up having some pressurized, anxious, frustrated thinking, some disappointed thinking in the moment. But the, but when you realise that's all it is, you'll find yourself catching it and you might even find yourself giggling. And in that moment, you'll know that you've taken a step forward in your own understanding of the inner game of golf. So I'd like to just finish off by, because I know some of you will be thinking, um, okay, well, what comes next? What, what can we expect next in terms of uh, what you're doing? Well, myself and Michael have already had some interest in um, retreats further down the road but we, what we want to do is really offer you to begin with a, an online format to begin to embed this knowledge at a deeper level so there will be seven further webinars over the next 12 weeks for you to listen to and, and pay attention to and they'll be covering a number of the, the following elements it will be based largely on the deeper knowledge that you've witnessed and listened to and, and watched tonight but we'll be considering how to fulfill your dream understanding mind, thought and consciousness and the implications of state control and performance. And some of that's already been alluded to tonight. We'll be looking at principles for a better golfing experience and actually how you can use those principles to help you overcome fear and the fear of failure, which is a pet, pet topic of mine. It's something that applied to me and an old pattern I had from the past. We'll be talking further about the importance or not of the pre-shot routine because there are important elements and there are less important elements and there'll be some experience that anecdotal evidence uh, around that as well as my own and Michael's experience. And we'll be applying the learnings from the principles in terms of how we can apply that to practice. And of course, crucially, we'll also be looking at question and answer and a bonus webinar where you will get to actually decide what we cover because we're going to open up for a questionnaire what it is you want to actually listen to and, and, and have the opportunity both through question and answer and bonus material for you to us to make sure we give you what you want in that final webinar. So in essence that's what's coming next. There is also the opportunity to, to sign up uh, and make sure that you can be with us over the next 12 weeks and the link there will you'll receive an email with the link to that uh, and what you'll find is if you follow um, the link, you'll end up uh, at a page like this where you have two options to either buy the package for the eight webinars in one go or with three monthly payments of £60 per month. So we would love to have you attend with us. 
Um, we'd love to have you with us for, for, for the next um, seven weeks to make sure that we can cover myself and Michael all of these elements with you. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, feel free to, to contact us. But we're really excited by sharing this journey over the next 12 weeks. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing you in a couple of weeks' time. The next webinar will be in two weeks' time, um, and you'll be receiving an email with confirmation of the dates and the timings of that so that you can make sure you, you get the opportunity to book on that. Um, so from myself and Michael, I feel like the two Ronnies here, Michael. It's goodbye from me. Um, it's goodbye, goodbye from Michael as well. Have a fab evening, everybody. It's been a pleasure sharing uh, this webinar experience with you. And we look forward to uh, sharing further knowledge to help you with your golf in the future. See you later, everybody. Bye. See you, Mike.